All right. So first, what I want to do is I want to start by um, giving you. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss Arlie is texting. Uh, I don't know what's the better way for me to, um, I probably need to start sharing the Zoom every um, class. All right, so when we go here, I want to explain to you all um, toxicology, microbiology, hematology, um, because if you ever see the ending word um, ology, which is O-L-O-G-E, let me rephrase this so you won't get confused with what I'm with what I'm meaning. And I can actually make it bigger too, so it can be easier. Okay, so right here in this first box where I have toxicology, microbiology, and hematology. I want to explain to you if you see any word that has the ending that means ology, that means the study of. Okay, so tox, toxic ology, microbiology, hema, hematology. So, what that means is toxicology is the study of toxins. If you don't know, if you come across the word toxin, that means too much of something. You know, everyone kind of use, um, oh, they're in a toxic relationship, or you may take too much, uh, too much medication, too much Tylenol, too much, and the doctor may tell you, oh, that was too toxic for you. That means it's too much, and it's too much, which means that if it's too much, it's not good for you. So toxicology is the study of toxins. OK, in phlebotomy, you will come across that often. Uh, if you see it on your national exam, just know it's the study of toxins. Microbiology. Microbiology is the study of microorganisms. So typically, if you have any blood work that is of culture, remember we talked about it this weekend. Let me go ahead and type that in here so it can kind of uh, make a little bit more sense. Any specimen that needs a culture, they are, it's going to go into the microbiology department of the lab, meaning because we talked about anything that the doctor orders a culture on means that the doctor is aware that you have some type of bacteria or microorganism in your urine, your stool, your blood, in your saliva, but he or she needs to know what is it. So now they're going to collect a culture. And once that culture is collected, it's going to go to the microbiology lab. OK, it's going to go straight to the microbiology lab. So definition, microbiology means the study of microorganisms. Any spe specimens that is of culture goes to that department. OK, blood cultures, the urine cultures that we did this weekend in the gray, in the gray urine tube, they are going to go to the microbiology lab. Hematology. Hematology is the study of blood. You will see this in phlebotomy very often because obviously you're working with blood. Oh, excuse me, y'all. I think I told y'all I was working from home and um, that's the ice machine making that noise if that's uh, irritating. Um, hematology is the study of blood. So you will often see uh, in phlebotomy words that say hematology. Hopefully your mind will reflect like, Ooh, that, that has ology, so that means the study of. And hema is blood. So hematology is the study of blood. Microbiology is the study of microorganisms. Toxicology is the study of toxins. Okay, so make note of that because in special collections, I'm gonna bring up some tests that the doctor will order that is formed around toxicology. Okay. 
All right. Let me go to my next box. I'm going to move that up and move my this box to the side a little bit. Try to see if I can make it bigger. All right. So I have four bullet points here. I call these the four H words. I really, really need you to take a picture, write this down, study them, get acquainted for them. They are very important to know. Remember, I already explained to you, I give, I'm giving you the vehicle. I just need you to get into your vehicle and drive. So the things that I say that is very important, I'm pretty much straightforward. I'll tell you that in the real world, you need to know this. That's why some things I put on the quiz, but I will also tell you the things that you will see on the national exam. You will see the most of this stuff that I'm going to go over tonight on the, the national exam and for sure these H words. OK, so the first one I want to go over, it's pronounced hemostasis. It means to cause blood to stop, the, the cause of blood. Let me, let me rephrase that. For bleeding to stop. I'm going to just make it as simple as that, okay? So what that means is, is that once you do your venipuncture procedure and you know how you guys, you you're, you're, uh, pop the tourniquet, you take the tube out and then you grab the gauze and with one hand you applying the gauze and with the other hand you're removing the needle out of the uh, out of the vein and you apply the pressure to the gauze and I mean you apply uh, pressure and remember I explained to you long as the patient is capable always get your patient to hold pressure okay when you're holding pressure and and when they're holding pressure and they're holding pressure firmly, they are creating hemostasis, right? That means for the bleeding to stop. So if anyone ever come to you and say, what's hemostasis? Or if anyone ever told, if anyone states to you in this way, make sure you use gauze because you need to create hemostasis. That all that means is for the bleeding to stop, okay? That's the most easiest way that I can explain that to you. It, hemostasis stasis means to stop. And if some of you have been uh, to any type of, uh, took anatomy and physiology, or even been to um, some type of school to where you are learning stasis and all of this uh, big genres, it just means stop. And remember, look at the first part of that word, the hema word, bleeding, okay? Stasis means stop. So basically, you are creating hemostasis when you apply that gauze on that arm or on that hand. And we have to apply pressure so we can stop bleeding, which is another word for hemostasis. So remember, Miss uh, McCray, she gets a, her blood work done that, uh, that her blood is thin in some cases. So you need to be sure that you create hemostasis for her, remember? So once you ask that question about um, if you are on any blood thinners, that just helps you to know, oh, okay, I need to check her out because I may need to uh, hold pressure a little longer. And that's because you want to be sure that you create hemostasis, okay? Just as simple. Hemostasis means for bleeding to stop, okay? Let's go to hematoma. Hema, H-E-M-A-T-O-M-A, -E hematoma. Another, another characteristics is still have that same hema in front. So obviously that means something dealing with the blood, okay? So what this means is a collection of blood in the tissue, not the, uh, oh, let me put that uh, in parentheses. What it means, a collection of blood in the tissue, and what that could mean is that when the blood starts to clot, underneath the skin. So remember, we kind of got our feet wet when I mentioned hematoma a little bit from the video when we started doing our needle positions. She talked about hematoma. So if you want to get accustomed to hematoma, just know that hematoma is a collection of blood underneath the tissue. And what that is, is a blood clot. And how can you get that is right here where I have not fully the needle not fully being in the vein. 
needle not fully being in the vein. Remember I talked about this weekend. If the needle, the bevel is halfway in the vein, halfway out, it's not all the way in. So the moment that you try to insert your tube, thinking you're gonna get blood return, that the blood start going in the tissue because your needle is halfway in your and halfway out. So you can cause a hematoma from that, okay? And also removing the needle before removing the tourniquet. Remember in class, I keep saying remember, but I'm getting you refresh. So remember in class with the technique that we did do, I informed you to pop the tourniquet, remove the tube, then remove the needle. In this case, if you remove the needle while the tourniquet is still on, you can cause a hematoma in the arm. So uh, underneath the skin, the blood clot underneath the skin. So therefore, we do not want to remove the needle before removing the tourniquet. We have to pop the tourniquet first before removing the needle, okay? Also, a hematoma can develop if you don't apply enough pressure when we put that gauze on there, okay? So if you just say, okay, Ms. Chopin, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to leave that gauze sitting here. So it's just sitting there. It's not no pressure. You just have it sitting there. So now the blood that is coming out is just leaking into the tissue. So now you may start to see a bruise of a collection of blood there because the pressure isn't held there. Okay, let me know if I lost anyone talking about hematoma. And it can create a bruise. Okay, hematoma, a collection of blood in the tissue, meaning another, another meaning is blood clot under the skin, which can create a bruise. And how can a hematoma um, be done if the needle is not fully in the vein, uh, fully being fully in the vein? Needle not fully in the vein on insertion. Also, removing the needle before removing the tourniquet can cause a hematoma. Also not applying enough pressure to the site can cause a hematoma, okay? All right, so my third H word is hemolysis. You still have that prefix of the same word, so you know it has something to deal with blood, okay? The ending is lysis. I don't know if you know, but I'm going to tell you. The ending word lysis means to destroy, destruct, tear something down, okay? So now this should tell you that it's the destruction of something in the blood. So the full definition is red blood cells have been destroyed, meaning the blood is hemolyzed. I kind of got my feet wet a little bit when we did our Inverting. Remember, our inverting is gently going from side to side. After we drew our blood, we call it inverting in a figure eight motion. And I mentioned to someone, if you do this, or if you shake the, the blood up, or if it's already packaged in your um, biohazard bag and it's thrown in the seat or thrown somewhere, that means that though the red blood cell within that blood can have a possibility of being destroyed. So now when it gets to the lab, the lab can say it can't be resulted because the blood is hemolyzed. I'm trying to underline it. Okay. So that's what it will look like from your lab. If they will say, it'll say the blood is hemolyzed. But the medical word is hemolysis. Red blood cells have been destroyed. How can that happen? Is if you vigorously shake your blood tube, okay? Throw it, however. Did you do it? Maybe not. Maybe the person that 
came to pick up the blood, he or she was so careless, they don't care. And they just threw the blood tubes in the bag or whatever the case may be. I'm not saying you did it as the phlebotomist, but I do want you to know what hemolysis means. And it means the uh, red blood cells have been destroyed, destruction of red blood cells. And what you will see on your quizzes and on your tests, when they give you an example of hemolyzed blood, you should be able to uh, get yourself familiarized like, oh, if, if this tube is shaken aggressively or vigorously, uh, the blood can be hemolyzed, okay? So just know uh, that term. Okay, last H word, which again, they all are important. So be sure to write it down, take a picture, study it. It's also in your book. Um, if you look in at the back of your book in your glossary for these words, it'll tell you what page that they're on for it to stick out to you because they're on different pages. Um, so uh, for example, I'm gonna tell you real quick. Hold on, hold on. On, way, on page 125, you will uh, have the two H words of hemolysis and hemoconcentration on page 125. And on page 131, you will see hematoma. One twenty-five and one thirty-one, and then hold on. <clears throat> I know hemostasis. Oh, and hemostasis is in the beginning, which is page thirty-five. So you have page thirty-five, page one twenty-five page, okay, yeah, 125 have both of them. So page 35, 125, and 131 has your H words. I call them H words, <laughs> whatever you want to remember them by, okay? So let me go ahead and get to the last one, which is called hemoconcentration. It has that same beginning H uh, prefix. So it has to do with something with blood. So the definition of hemoconcentration is increased blood, concentra increased blood concentration, that's it. So basically it just means that the blood has a high concentration. What is concentration? It can be the liquidity of anything. Our urine can be concentrated. You know, uh, for example, you think about your orange juices and things like that. When you go to the grocery store and it says from concentrate. So it's just a lot of acid, okay? A lot of acid and a lot of buildup. So basically blood can do that too. So hemoconcentration means it's an increase of blood concentration in your blood. How can that happen is leaving the tourniquet on too long. So remember, I talked about when we learned how to tie the tourniquet and I gave you some uh, things to remember with the tourniquet. It can only be on, uh, on or tied in place on your patient for 60 seconds, which is a minute. So typically, you can cause the blood to have high concentration if you leave it on too long, okay? So if you were to see on your test and it gave you uh, the word hemoconcentration and it had you choose what, how can your the blood get concentrated, hopefully that you will know that it can be concentrated for leaving the tourniquet on too long. Okay, so for example, I just so happen to be on page 125. It talks about hemoconcentration. Hemoconcentration describes a buildup of blood cells uh, uh, related to liquid components of the blood. This can occur when a tourniquet is left on too long and is falsely, it falsely elevates the blood cell counts, meaning it makes the blood uh, have high concentration. So if you leave the tourniquet on too long is an example of how that blood can be um, uh, concentrated, okay? All 
All right. So we have our H words, hemostasis, which is to stop bleeding, hematoma, which is basically a blood clot in the tissues because you was halfway in the vein, halfway out, or you removed the needle, needle before removing the tourniquet, or you didn't apply pressure to the site to try to, while you were trying to create hemostasis. Okay, hemolysis is the destruction of red blood cells, and that can happen if you vigorously shake your blood tube with the blood in it. Um, hemoconcentration is the uh, concentration in the blood is high, and that can happen if the tourniquet is left on for too long. Do I have any questions regarding what I have went over uh, thus far? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, can a, a hematoma happen? Can a hematoma happen like regardless? Like if you leave the um tourniquet on, hold on, wait, let me think. Let me make sure that's the right one. No, I think that's no. Yeah, you said a hematoma happens when you leave when you leave when you take. Hold on, let me read my notes. <laughs> a collection of blood. Yeah, that's a blood clot. The hematoma is a blood clot, yes. Before taking off the tourniquet. Okay, so if you do that, they're going to get a hematoma regardless? I'm not going to say regardless, but uh -huh. it can happen. All okay. of this is it can happen. It, okay. it, it's, not a, it's not a for certain. I can't be positive. You okay. know, so if you're halfway in the vein, halfway out, a hematoma can develop. If okay. you remove the needle before popping, the tourniquet it can develop if you don't apply enough pressure it can develop just like hemolysis if you vigorously uh, uh shake the tube it, it hemolyze can develop but you would never know until it gets to the lab and they tell you if it could be resulted or not okay, okay. yeah but just know the causes of it you know yes okay all right, let's go ahead and move forward. Your next quiz is over medical terminology. So, you know, I just want you to input, I mean, get as much intake as you can. Um, all right, so I wanna go ahead and move to my green box here. Let me try to move some of them out the way because I don't know how big it's showing on your end. So. All right. We can zoom in on ours. Oh, okay. I'm just about to say we can make it as big as what we need to. Oh, cool. Thank you for telling me that because I don't know how it's going on that side. All right. So my next group of words, um, syncope will be my next will be my next one. And I can tell you guys that syncope is on page 34. Um, so I don't know how, how quick you can make those notes without me, you know, um, getting you discombobulated, but uh, 35 has syncope um, on it. Well, actually 34, sorry. All right. So the word syncope, medical terminology means just feeling faint. Simple. Okay. Learn how to spell it just so you can be record, so you can recognize the word. It's not that the national exam is going to make you spell it or, you know, trick you about like how they do the hip and the OSHA, but just recognize it. It's pronounced syncope, S-Y-N-C-O-P-E, syncope. So basically, if someone was to tell you, because maybe they're a nurse or maybe they're in a the medical field, and when you ask them, have you, have you ever had any complications while um, you get your blood drawn before? And if they say, because somebody like me may say, you know, well, I'll be getting syncope sometimes, you know, and then you probably be, what is that? So I, it is very common in phlebotomy world to know what syncope is. And it basically just means feeling faint or somebody feel like they finna lose consciousness. Okay. Syncope, feeling faint. And in your book, um, it tells you, for example, the medical term for fainting is syncope. The skin may uh, turn blue or gray. Um, that's called cyanotic, but you can read that later. Uh, that I will 
go over that word when we do CPR. But as far as syncope, it is very um, uh, feasible to, uh, it is very important to know and recognize what the word syncope means. And it just means feeling faint, okay? Because if somebody do tell you that, or let's just say your coworker or a doctor may come into the lab and say, oh, you know, uh, uh, Ms. Chopin had a syncopal episode and I want to do a CBC or whatever on her. So I need you guys to come into the uh, the room and do it. And so just using that term, you just know like syncopal episode, oh, Ms. Chopin almost fainted. Okay. So just know what that is and be familiar with that. But just that simple, I don't have to draw, I don't have to draw it out or make it long, but just know how to pronounce it, syncope, know how to see it and um, know what it means. And it's just mean uh, feeling faint, just like that. Okay. My next word, they're not together. Sorry about that, but I'm giving you all the important words that you need to know for medical terminology. My next word is pronounced edema, and that is going to be in your book on page 157. Oh, you know what I could do? Hmm, I just thought about something. All right, edema, E-D-E-M-A, edema. And what that means is it's fluid in the tissue. Basically, you're swollen. So um, in medical terminology, or uh, I mean in medical terminology, in the medical field, or you may have a loved one or someone at home, the hands may be a little puffy, feet may be a little puffy. And they say, oh, your hands are swollen. Oh, your feet is swollen. Well, the medical terminology name for it is edema, okay? And it matters in phlebotomy because you don't want to draw blood from someone's arm or hand that is swollen. Because the moment that you obviously would stick the needle in there, what you think is going to come out the skin? Fluid. The fluid is going to come out. So you don't want to mix the fluid with the blood and therefore it's going to basically tamper with the results because it's going to thin the blood out. So if anybody has a uh, swelling going on, we don't want to draw from those sites. Okay. So just know and recognize that edema means a uh, fluid in the tissue. And that means that the patient is swollen. In your book on one page on page 157, it says patients with edema or swelling of the hands are not good candidates for capillary punctures um, or neither blood draws. And remember, capillary punctures is from the finger. So even though you're not drawing in the vein, you still don't need to prick their finger because their hand is swollen. OK, and it will tamper and mix with the blood and thin the blood so the results won't be as accurate. OK. All right. My next word is pronounced petechiae. Um, you can kind of get yourself familiar with seeing it. Um, that is going to be on page 145. All right, page 145, petechiae are small red slash purple spots on the skin. And basically, remember I told you guys that capillaries are the smallest blood, which is mixed with the uh, artery vein and the, uh, the artery blood and the vein blood together when we do those capillary fields, um, capillary punctures. And as we all did it in class this weekend, you see it's very small. So the blood just comes from out the tissue. It's not in a vein, it's not in a, it's, uh, it's not in a vein, it's not in a artery, it's just right underneath the skin. So with that being said, someone can have broken capillaries everywhere and it will cause the skin to have purplish red dots. I wanna show you, um, a picture of it and you probably that like spider-man huh is that like the spider mains no it almost looked like an allergic reaction because i had that before like yes that, or like it looked like it's oh no it's not a spider bite though but i had that before it made um, me want to scratch it but it's like it's like little dots Mm 
Yeah. yeah. So this is like this. So basically, someone got petechiae. It can happen on the arms, the legs, anywhere. And basically, the capillaries just broken and they dispersed underneath the skin. And because of it, you see these purple, red spots. Depending on what color skin tone you are, you know, it'll be purple or red. You know, some people pink. And basically, it could have been that when you actually went in to do the blood draw, you know, you could have, as you were going in, you could have just popped the capillary and this particular rash type area happened. And that's just petechiae. I mean, it's very, um, I would say it's not that easy to, 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 uh, uh, it's, I don't think that it's easy for you to do for a patient. And sometimes it don't even have to be done. Um, with blood draw, it could be IV therapy. They had IV fluids and something happened and it was too much for their uh, capillaries and they just broken off and now they have this little rashy type area. Okay. But in phobotomy, I just want you to know what that is. Like, oh, you have little petechiae spots on there. Okay. And so in your book on page 145, it's used as for bottomy technicians should be aware that some patients may develop a rash-like condition known as petechiae. After a tourniquet is applied, these small flat red or purple dots are created by the leaking of blood from capillaries. Petechiae may be associated with a number of different health conditions. So sometimes it has nothing to do with blood drawing, okay? But if you was to see it, then you will know that it's petechiae and I would not use that uh, area of their uh, limbs or extremities uh, to do your blood draw. Find a different, go to the opposite arm or just go below on the hand where the petechiae is not showing. Okay. Doesn't necessarily mean you did it at all, you know, but, and the reason why they use the tourniquet as a, uh, as an example is because sometimes the tourniquet can be tied too tight and it can cause the capillary to kind of bust like that and create that uh, petechiae. Okay. Next, aseptic or antiseptic. Okay. We went over this before, but I just want you all to remember, we have to be sure that we do everything to control any infection. So when we use aseptic technique or, or it's labeled, uh, if we use any aseptic supplies or use the antiseptic technique, all that means is that we made sure we cleaned and disinfected our site before inserting the needle or, or doing the puncture of the finger. So we used our alcohol, you know, or we may have used our chlorhexidine gluconate that we looked at this weekend, which is another form of aseptic technique to use. And remember, I'll talk about it again over special collections. If you have on your requisition that the doctor wants a alcohol level test done on your patient, then that's the only time, one of the main times we don't even use alcohol to wipe the site. We're going to use that chlorhexidine gluconate that we talked about. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, it's pretty straightforward and simple, but I'm almost certain you can find a septic technique in your, uh, in your book, uh, 69 and 108. Um, but just know that once you use your aseptic technique, you are freeing the area away from any bacteria or germs that can cause going in the skin if you didn't wipe it and use your needle, okay? But yeah, it's on those pages that um, I mentioned if you just wanted to go over aseptic, but basically you're using whatever is necessary to clean the skin to make free from any bacteria or germs on the skin. All right, 
So just know aseptic and antiseptic technique, all right? Now, what's very important that I'm sure most of you may know, but just in case, I do want to tell you in phlebotomy and medical period, you will see ASAP and STAT a lot. That means as soon as possible. That means immediately. So if you had four orders and you, you was working in a hospital as a phlebotomist and you have room 102, 103, 104, 105, but then room 104 order said stat. But even though 102 is before, the room number is before uh, the other room, you need to go to the one that says stat. So you treat that immediately because that means that the doctor needs those results, need that patient blood to be drawn right away. So it can go ahead and start being resulted. And they're going to put that as immediately to where the medical uh, lab technician can start um, mixing the blood to go ahead to make the results. Okay. So just know ASAP or stat means immediately and you would draw that patient blood first okay so that is priority okay asap or stat which i know that that's pretty easy to know but um just keep that in mind um that in phlebotomy you will see that often okay what does that stand for uh oh hold on <laughs> <laughs> that's a that's a good one the actual because of course asap is as soon as possible but stat hold on because that's a good one because i'm, I'm probably i always hear people say asap or stat but i never knew what stat stood for they still don't explain it a stat test is one that must be uh, that must be performed immediately, and laboratories must have a department specially designed to handle these tests. So they will go to their own department, but it'll be stat. But then, so it still don't even say what STAT, and they use it again on page one fourteen. Let me just see five and one fourteen is what a uh, stat is used. Oh, they use ASAP on page 114, which we know what ASAP means. But that's a good question. I don't know if you find out if it's somewhere in some dictionary, because throughout all my years, I've never seen, you know, like a type of abbreviation for STAT. I have never seen it, but it I feel like it has to mean something. I mean, we know what it means, but what does it stand for? So that's a good question, though. So let me see. Google, Google and word. Ignore, ignore my background, but Google says the word stat comes from a Latin word statinum, right. which translates to immediately and means that order should be prioritized first as needed urgently. Okay, so it's short for statinum, you say. Yeah. Ah. Oh. Okay. Well, I've learned something today, statting them. And so they just cut that word short to stat. Okay. Well, thank you for that. So it basically mean immediately. Yeah, right. ASAP stat means that's okay. All right. So with that being said, ladies, hopefully you will really remember ASAP and stat because you will see it a lot. Because with people being sick and sometimes of emergency, a lot of times doctors will order blood work stat. So you will see that. So that means that you will go to them first and do their blood. And let's just say, if you were not able to get their blood because maybe they're difficult stick or you having a hard time it is your job to you know have someone else draw you know will tell someone else about it because the doctor needs their blood stat okay so just take the accountability to be sure that that patient blood gets drawn and it's just basically for their health okay the doctor needs it right away all right, so personal protective equipment at the bottom of my screen, I think by now um, I have mentioned it a couple of times, but just know that PPE 
stands for personal protective equipment. Like I did mention on our day that we do CPR, I will demonstrate a personal protective equipment because on your national exam, not only do you need to know PP in real life, but on your exam, it will test your knowledge if you get that question on how, what order to put your uh, equipment on and what order to take it off because it is a way. It is an order and it is only to protect you free from germs. So for example, in a real life, some people don't care how they put it on. I'm telling you, like I told you, I'm a teacher the right way. But in real life, when you're putting on your personal uh, protective equipment, some people don't care what order they put it on. But when you take it off, it is it's very important to know how to take it off because now that you've dealt with your patient that's infected with something, you wanna be sure that you take off your equipment properly without contaminating yourself and taking it home to your family. So personal protective equipment is these gloves, gown, mask, and face shield. Some people uh, also wear goggles. That's the same thing as a face shield. But this, these four components equal to personal protective equipment, okay? So I will also, that same day that I go over personal protective equipment, I would um, also explain to you, though, remember I explained the different precautions. Right now, we know standard precautions means that we're using standard universal precautions on everyone by wearing gloves because we are assuming that all bodily fluids um, are contaminated with something. So that's standard precautions. So that's only gloves, you know, but like I said, now because of COVID, most places, you know, will prefer you to also wear gloves. So it depends, but for sure gloves. Now, if a person is known to have something, if a person is known to have, you know, tuberculosis, or if you touch, you know, the, their urine, or if you touch their blood, it's contaminated with something. Now you need to know your other PPE to put on. You want to protect your, your clothing. So you want to put on a gown. You want to protect your face so it won't splash. So if anybody the fluid splashed in your face, you have on a face shield or goggles. And of course, masks. Is for tuberculosis uh, for any airborne or droplet. And I will explain that to you um, when I do personal protective equipment uh, demonstration, okay? But I just want you to know, because I know by now you've been seeing PPE everywhere. Just know it stands for personal protection, protective equipment. And that is uh, gloves, gown, mask, and um, face shield or goggles, okay? Let me move that out the way. I'm going to go over artery and vein in just a minute. Okay, let me go ahead and go to my orange box here because it's a big entity um, for us. It's kind of like a little definition, kind of like how HIPAA and OSHA was. I want to explain to you um, CLSI is my first it stands for Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. In your book, it is going to be on page, give me one second. Let's see, CLIA is on page five and CLSI is on page 10. So these rules that we do, for example, by um, when we do our venipuncture and I, and I teach you to pop the tourniquet, remove the tube, and then remove the needle. Uh, another example, our orders of draws. Like, how do we know? I mean, who, who taught who to, that we have to go in the order of draw with the color tube so we won't contaminate the previous tube with um, the additive that's in the tube to mess up the blood results. Where did that even come from, right? Now, why do we have to, when we wipe with alcohol, why do we have to let it air dry? Why we can't wave over it? Why we can't blow on someone's arm? I mean, I know that that's gross, but I'm just saying. So all of, all of that of what I'm getting at is CLSI, Clinical Laboratory Improvement uh, in Amendment is the organization that develops the standard of practice in laboratories. They are a company, an 
organization that is constantly doing research, constantly stand apart when it comes to blood and specimens for humans. So it wasn't just made up by doctors. It wasn't just made up by instructors. It wasn't just made up by nursing. There is an actual organization called CLSI that uh, makes these standards of practice in laboratories. If you haven't noticed already, a lot of the videos that I show, um, they may say per CLSI standards or according to CLSI. Well, that's because that's the organization that even tells us how to do this stuff in the laboratory, okay? Tells us how to handle the specimen. Tells us that, oh, obviously if you vigorously shake the tube, the blood will be hemolyzed, okay? And so because of that, we have to not visually vigorously shake the tube. If we leave the tourniquet on for longer than 60 seconds, then CL, per CLSI standards, the blood can be hemoconcentrated, okay? So with that being said, I want you to get yourself familiar with Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, and it stands for CLSI. Those are the people that even tell us what to do in the lab, how to even do it right, what we need to do, okay? So in your book on page 10, it says the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, CLSI, is a nonprofit organization that works with government agencies and healthcare providers and institutions to develop the standards of practice for laboratories worldwide. Okay, although CLSI does not perform reviews or uh, accredit laboratories, following CLSI standard is an important part of providing quality care. So CLSI is the ones to tell us that why we're doing this. And because of CLSI standards, and if we are governed in laboratories as phlebotomy is, as instructors, we have to teach per CLSI standards. Does that make any sense to you guys? Okay. So next, I want to go to below it, which it looks familiar, but it's different. Clinical and laboratory standards. Uh, oh, no. Hold on. I put the wrong, um, I put the wrong, um, what you call it for, hold on, I'm gonna fix it y'all, sorry. Cause this is clear. What I just went over was correct, but I don't, it wasn't correct the way that I had it. Uh, hold on. And then this one is. Okay, so CLSI is Clinical and Laboratory Standard um, and Standard Institute, while the one that I'm going to go over right now is Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. And let me tell you what page that is on real quick. Sorry, hopefully I didn't confuse anyone with that. Page 
page five, which I did. So 10 has Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute that I just went over. And page five is going to have um, my CLIA. Actually, page three has my CLIA. So, okay, so CLIA, uh, let me move this. Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendments. It stands for CLIA, C-L-I-A. Now, you may think I'm saying like clear, like clear everything out the hallway, but you'll just say CLIA, which is C-L-I-A and just see what it stands for. Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, okay? What that is is, CLIA is a federal regulation regarding operation of laboratories worldwide. So what I'm saying is, I think I mentioned to you all that I am actually CLIA certified to function as a laboratory, but I just don't function as a laboratory because my whole ultimate goal is to create jobs for phlebotomists that come to my school um, to where we can uh, develop a mobile phlebotomy. Um, I mean, not mobile, mobile phlebotomy and in-person uh, lab to where we can actually test specimens. No matter, I don't care if I just wanted to dip urine all day, or I don't care if we just wanted to do COVID tests all day, or I don't care if I just wanted to do pregnancy pregnancy tests all day. If we're going to test any, if we're going to be a laboratory that tests any human of anything, you have to be approved by CLIA to even do that. So whatever lab that you work in, your lab is going to have a CLIA certification to say that they are CLIA approved. And CLIA is Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, CLIA federal regulation regarding operation of laboratory. So CLIA is telling me that I am approved to function as a lab, no matter, no matter how big, how small, no matter where I'm located in US of A, I have to have a CLIA uh, certification to say that I can function as a lab, okay? Like I said, I could just say I'm a lab that do uh, urine pregnancy tests. I mean, uh, urine dipsticks. I'll say, oh, you know, any... Uh, any evidence of a UTI, you know, come to such and such, such and such lab and we'll test your lab. Okay. Of course it has to be a nurse practitioner or a doctor, which I have that, you know, you, you go to for the, give the results so they can prescribe something. But all I'm saying is no matter how big or how small your lab is, if you are testing anything that's human on anything by way of getting results, um, it needs to be clear way. It needs to be approved through clear. So for example, this past weekend, we dipped urine and we also did finger sticks. We got those results back rapid. We got our glucose uh, numbers back and we also got our urine dipstick back to see if we had a urinary tract infection of some sort. Those can be done in a lab. I could be, I can do those in a lab right now, right? I have my clear and they are rapid tests. So I explained it in that way so you can know that CLIA means you are approved to work function as a laboratory to test anything, any human, uh, anything human on a person. And I keep saying human because animals have their own type of lab. Of course, they have veterinarians, but they have their own lab. You, we don't test. Uh, animal blood, okay? We test human blood. And if you want to do that, you need to have your approval through CLIA, Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, in which I don't know if I showed you all, but it's in the hallway, but I'll show you what it looks like in person where it actually says Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment. And in your book, it states laboratories in the, uh, in the United States must meet standards 
listed in a set of regulations called the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Amendment, which stands for CLIA. This includes educational requirements for certain laboratory employees, as well as rules for handling patient specimens and tests and quality assurance and control practices. So if you're going to work in any lab, you already know that they have to be approved by CLIA. Uh, you think I use the example for any cosmetologist, anybody that does your nails, does your pedicures, you know, probably does your uh, eyebrows or, you know, does your hair. They have a certificate of co cosmetology to say that they can, you know, practice um, as a cosmetologist. So the same thing with the lab, they have to show proof that they have been approved to function as a lab. And these certificates do expire. So they have to keep up those certifications um, to be approved, okay? Do I have any questions regarding CLSI and CLIA? One tells us what to do in the lab. One tells us that we are approved to even be a lab, okay? Did I lose anyone on that? A little bit. Um, okay, I'm trying to, the last thing you said, you said CLSI, tell us what to do in lab, and CLIA, tell us we could be in the lab? Uh, CLIA tells us that the lab was approved to even be a lab. The lab was approved. Okay, so you said that you can do CLIA, so that means like you CLI. CLIA certified? Correct. Okay, so you go get a certificate to be a CLIA? I have one, yes. Okay. So Ooh. that mean, that means that if tomorrow I wake up and start getting supplies and start advertising that people can come to me for different tests, I can do that because I'm already approved. I have my clear certificate. Okay. But CLSI tells us the guidelines on what to do as a lab, like I, like I mentioned, the order of draw. They're the one that developed that. You know, how we do our venipuncture technique and what order we do it. they the one, you know, told us about that, how to do that. You know, just different things of how we function in a lab with the, with the specimen. That's a CLSI. Okay. All right. Medical terminology, you know, it could be a lot, um, but I am trying to explain it to the best of my ability. And then you still have to go over and study it and, and get it implanted in your brain because typically what I'm giving you is what you will see all the time. Okay. So once you actually, um, get yourself comfortable with this, everything would just make sense, you know, all together. Okay. Now, real quickly, you see, I have this little purple pink box where it says supine land down, uh, laying down face up and lateral meaning uh, to the side. So I want to share, um, I'm going to take the, the whiteboard off for a minute. And I want to share, um, a position, uh, a position dot image, which is this, because in phlebotomy, um, it is important to just be aware. So you see, obviously as a lady, I mean, she don't have no face, but it looked like it's a lady, but you see that she, she is laying down. One picture, she's laying face down on her stomach. One picture, she's laying face up on her back, looking to the sky. So she's in a prone position here versus a supine position here. So if someone was to, if you were to do start CPR on someone, you need to lie them supine. If someone tells you that they do better with you drawing their blood laying down, 10 times out of 10, that's supine. No one will ever be laying prone position here facing downward with a face in the mattress, okay? So what I want you to be aware of the word supine, S-U-P-I-N-E, pronounced supine. Typically, 
I mean, only straight up. It just means that your patient is laying face uh, up on their back, supine. So you may come across complications where someone say, I do better laying down because sometimes I may faint, you know, so if they're already laying down or the case may be, it's easier for them to already be stabilized to where they're just laying down. Okay. And typically if someone is going to have a syncopal episode, feel syncope, remember feeling like they're going to faint, well, they're already in a line position. So it's just safer for them. OK, so I want you to be mindful uh, to be uh, familiarized with this word supine, S-U-P-I-N-E, -E, meaning that you're lying down on your back looking up to the sky. And that's the safest position in the medical world. Now, what I do want you to also be familiar with is this word lateral. That's what I also had in the pink box is lateral, L-A-T-E-R-A-L, -A -A lateral. If you ever was to see the word lateral, I just want you to know that just means side. So if you're taking notes and writing down lateral, just write down S-I-D-E to the side. So if someone say, okay, Ms. Chopin, I want you to, uh, um, uh, I want you to stand right lateral or left lateral. Or I want you to lay uh, right lateral, left lateral. That just means they want me to lay on my right side or left side. They want me to stand to my left side or my right side. Just know in the medical world that uh, lateral means side. And supine means laying down on your back, uh, looking at the sky. These other ones is not really important to know until you start to um, take your uh, uh, medical up higher for like nursing and things of that nature. And this is just showing an image. So obviously you can kind of see that this position Fowler's is someone is just sitting in a reclining chair or they're in a hospital bed with the head of the bed all the way up to where they're a little bit reclined, okay? But for me and you, the most important one that I want you to, the most important ones that I want you to get out of it is supine and lateral, okay? And for the most part, if you wanna get yourself familiarized with prone, because you may have a question that says, um, as a phlebotomist, your patient instructed to the, because you know, these questions wanna be way professional. As a phlebotomist, your patient explained to, to you that they have metophobia and what is the best position for them. It may have an option as prone, supine. It may have an option as something else. And I don't want you to be, you'll remember like, oh, they need to be laying down and you pick prone. Uh, so if you want to get yourself familiarized with prone, do that. But it's always going to be supine, S-U-P-I-N. You will never have a patient lie on their back with their head facing in the mattress. Not that I know of. Even once you, you know, give enemas and things like that, the more you further your nursing career, they're not laying like that. They're laying on their side, okay? Laterally. Do I have any questions regarding this position of supine and lateral? I know that there's other pictures on here, but I want you to focus with supine and lateral. Okay, supine and lateral. And I will quiz you and we will play another game like we did on Sunday with the Kahoot and to get you familiarized with it. But I do want you to be sure that you take good notes and review them, um, you know, when we don't meet so you can get yourself familiarized. Okay, supine and lateral. All right, let's move a little bit forward back to the whiteboard. Now, right here, we are, by now we should already be, you know, kind of familiar with, with standard precautions, which that means we want to assume all bodily fluids, um, you know, is contaminated, uh, has some type of bacteria. Even though they don't, we just, we just acting like they do, okay? Um, now, 
I mentioned to you all on Sunday when we did our urine dips and our finger sticks or our capillary sticks versus our dermal punctures. Remember, they mean the same, same thing. I want you to be mindful of POCT, meaning point of care testing. Remember, I talked about that. And any point of, so for instance, we just talked about me being CLIA certified. If I want to just do all point of care testing in my lab, I can do that. I mean, hey, it makes my life a little easier, right? So just to refresh your memory, remember point of care testing means any testing that can be done at the patient's bedside or that can be done quickly, uh, rapidly because the results come back rapidly within within up to 15 minutes. Now, point of care testing is shown on a couple of uh, uh, pages. Let me go to page 23 so I can see how they uh, discuss it here. Okay. So point of care testing um, on page 23. Phobotomy technicians may perform these tests at some facility. Many CLIA wave tests are point of care tests, meaning the testing is done near or in the presence of the patient, but not all point of care testing are clear way and not all can be performed uh, by phrobotomy. So with that being said, um, you see if, if you are one of the ones looking on page 23, you'll see right underneath there the diagram, they're doing what we did this Sunday. They're doing capillary puncture and it says tests with very little risk of error are known as clear wave tests uh, phobotomists sometimes perform these tests. So the way that I want you to remember point of care testing is that any test that you can do while the patient is there and the results come back right away, okay? That's why it's easy to run a lab with these type of testing because the results come back. OK, like I said, you got your COVID test that's rapid. You got pregnancy tests that, that can come back rapid. Um, you have your urine dipstick that can come back rapid. You have your glucose testing that can come back rapid. You also have your iron levels that can come back rapid. All of those are considered point of care testing. Anything that the results can come back right then. Now, I'm not telling you that pregnancy tests um, is only rapid. Remember, you can uh, have your blood drawn to know if you're pregnant, but those, if your blood is drawn through venipuncture, it's not going to come back rapid. It takes some time. You know, uh, uh, it takes up to six hours, sometimes 24 hours to come back, right? Urine your analysis that we did in class, remember we, we did the urine dipstick, but we also talked about how to send the yellow urine one to the lab. So with that being said, that's not considered a, a point of care test because now we did the point of care test, but now we put our urine in the tube to be sent off to the lab. And so that uh, makes it a, a more specimen uh, for the lab to result, okay? Um, same difference for, for blood sugar, for glucose. We did our glucose this weekend, but we got our results back rapid. But if the doctor wants a more, um, a more up-to-date um, result, he's going to draw your glucose per your vein, per venipuncture. So I don't want you to get confused to say, oh, all of this got to be done rapid. It don't have to, but if it's done rapidly, meaning you get your results back within 15 minutes, it's considered point of care testing. Okay. Point of care testing. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, move forward. Right in my same little box here, where the point of care testing is, you see that um, it talks about uh, informed consent and implied consent. Remember, we did talk about that this weekend, but because you're going to see this a lot, I just want to be sure to, um, I want to be sure that you understand and that you can go ahead and go through. Uh, your consent, give me one second. Consenting is on um, starting on page 24 in your book. So 
starting on page 24 rather. Um, so I just want you to know, we talked about consent. We know that you need to get your patient's consent before you even draw blood. Depending on what lab you work at, they're going to give you that in new, new or, uh, employee orientation. If they have a written paper that they need the patient to sign versus you verbally telling them to inform them. And that's where I want to talk about here with informed consent and implied consent. Because remember, we do have a difference. Uh, both of them are consenting, but they are kind of done in a more, uh, in a more uh, different way. Informed consent, like is mentioned on your Ooh, excuse me, like it's mentioned on page 24, where it talks about when a patient gives informed consent, she is acknowledging that she understands the treatment she will receive and agrees to receive it. So it's all informed. Rather, the doctor gave you a paper for the patient to uh, sign off. It's still a type of informed consent, okay? And if the patient expresses consent, um, that means that, oh, okay, yeah, I understand everything. Um, thank you so much. Um, you know, uh, Miss uh, McCray, I do understand everything. So you, it's either going to be one of the two. It's going to be informed consent where the patient verbalized that he or she understands, or it's going to be implied consent. Remember, we use implied if someone is in critical life-threatening condition before they even sign an emergency room consent or whatever, everybody is doing what they need to do to save that patient's life because the patient, because then we are implying that the, the patient wants help. Okay, let's just say the patient comes to and or the uh, legal guardian or um, the person that is over the power of attorney say, oh, no, I have papers here. You know, she doesn't even if, if she have tubes in her, she says she didn't want to have tubes. OK, that's fine. We did what we could do to save his or her life. But now the evidence has come out and we see that. So now we will stop all medical, uh, all medical treatment. Um, let's just say also, let's just say um, I'm in the hospital, I've already signed consent to be treated, but you went into the room and you explained to me that you need to draw blood because the doctor um, advised the blood, but let's just say your patient has a tube in his or her mouth, but clearly he's awake, she or he is awake and looking at you. They can't talk, they can't do anything. Um, as far as verbally, but if they lend their arm out to you, even though they can't talk, they are implying that they want you to draw their, their arm, I mean, their, their blood, okay? Let's just say you're working in an outpatient lab, similar. Let's just say you're working with a, a, a adult that is uh, that has some type of mental delay or, you know, it is, uh, you know, not the same as someone else and he or she, you know, can't talk or let's just say it was an adult that had a stroke and she or she or he can't talk right. But if you, they see that they're in the lab and you talking to them, getting their, you know, consent, if I take my arm or if your patient take his or her arm out the jacket and then lend the arm to you, that's the same thing as implying. They're implying that they want their blood drawn. Okay, so know the difference between the two informed consent is you told the patient about what you're going to do and they have been uh, and they have acknowledged that they understand or imply consent mean they came verbally, you know, talk to you or it's been a life threatening situation and in, through implied consent, you go ahead and treat them and you do what you need to do. Um, um, do I have, uh-huh, go ahead. Have, if somebody in the, um. If somebody in a coma and they don't have nobody to vouch for them, how would that work? That's implied okay. consent because that's the same thing as life threatening. Okay. And typically, I know that, you know, some of you may not know, but medical wise, for example, you said someone in a coma. Yes, um, so someone in a, let's just say someone um, had some type of bad accident. And it, it, it resulted in them being in a coma and still no family member has come about. Well, it's, it, you started off a life threatening. And so 
they are implying that they need, they want to be seen because this is life threatening. So let's uh, just say they've been in a coma for two or three days. No one came. So you still continue to treat them. But let's just say all of a sudden a family member, you know, found out or you guys were able to reach the family member that was way in California they came down and that person is over that person and they say oh I have it right here you know uh -huh. if he or she is on tubes or or whatever they don't want they don't want to be treated they don't want any medical uh intervening so then at that point they will stop okay but let's just say the same situation that she came from California there is no uh medical will in place that they um uh, that the patient you know want them to stop and they don't have nothing like that um you know nothing like that on file then they will still just continue to treat the patient okay um that's why it is very important for people to have things in place so you can you know have your wishes but if nothing is in place then the doctor the team the medical team will imply that you want everything done for you all right thank you uh-huh Okay, so I just want you to know the difference between, you know, those different consents and things of that nature. Um, okay, let me move this to the side. Now, even though we did capillary punctures this weekend, I explained to you that capillary uh, blood is very small blood. So just so you can read it a little bit, capillaries are the smallest blood vessel that contain both venous and arterial blood. Examples are when we do the capillary puncture. Remember, dermal puncture and capillary puncture means the same thing. OK, so with that being said, when we prick the finger or we prick the heel of the infant, that small blood is coming out is small blood vessels, which altogether is capillaries. OK, so just know that there is a such thing as capillary blood, which are very, very small blood vessels that contain both the artery and the vein. OK, now my blue box here that I have here would be my last that. Uh, I would uh, second to last that I would go with, and that is artery and vein. I want to explain to you. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the whiteboard again and show you a image. Oh, no. Okay, okay. Can you, you say capillary puncture or what puncture? That was the last little thing I was trying to write. Is the same thing? Uh, capillary puncture and dermal puncture is the same okay. thing. Okay, dermal thing. is yeah, D E. R M A L. Okay. Okay, gotcha. And that's what you we have to get you caught up with because that's what we did on Sunday. Right. That's what I'm trying to trying my best to hang in, but some stuff is, is going right over my head, but I understand I miss Sunday. Okay. So this is a image of an artery and a vein. Typically, arteries are known to be red in color and veins are known to be blue. That's why sometimes when we're getting in the habit of looking for a vein, if we see it, typically you see like green or blue, right? That's because we are doing a vena puncture. We are getting venous blood. That means we're um, sticking the patient. We're doing our uh, in, uh, insertion in the vein. Okay. So typically the veins are blue in color. You know, some people underneath the skin, depending on the color of their skin, that's why on some of us you will see See, it would look like green is blue, but typically veins are blue and arteries are red. And the reason being is, is that veins carry uh, oxygen depleted blood, meaning there's no oxygen. And it's carrying that blood to our heart to re-energize and gas up to get oxygen. And then once they gas, up, once the blood basically gases up to get oxygen, now it's coming out of the heart, away from the heart as artery blood, okay? The arteries 
carry oxygenated blood. And that's why that blood is a more bright red blood versus our uh, vein blood being red, but it's kind of darker red in person. So that's why we also say when not to draw from the basilic uh, vein, because if you go too deep past that vein and you hit an artery, the patient is going to uh, bleed bright red blood. So if you ever see bright red blood, that means that that is artery blood and you need to really hold pressure for a while to collect, to create hemostasis, which means to stop bleeding because that artery blood, the arteries are more deeper in us than veins. So that's why we don't draw as, as phlebotomists, you do not draw any blood from the artery. Although blood can be drawn from the artery for different reasons, as a phlebotomist, all of your blood work is going to be done from a vein, okay? So veins are blue because they have no oxygen. Arteries are red because the blood has oxygen, okay? So that's um, how, like, if they get shot. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. I'm sorry. What color no. did you say that the artery blood is? Red. Okay. Did you see the diagram? I mean, it's, it's bright red, bright, bright red blood. I had another question. Yeah, so that's why when people, um, like, they get shot or stabbed in the artery, like, they quicker to die faster because that's the blood with the oxygen in it. Um, I'm not going to say they quicker to die faster because that's the blood with the oxygen in it, but they're quicker and, and excuse my terms, but we're going to be frank. Like you said, it's they're quicker to lose their life because that blood is hard to stop. So once some, you know, somebody say, oh, they got shot in the leg or got shot in the arm and it hit a main artery. Well, not only was it a main artery, but it was an artery and it's hard to stop the bleeding. So that's why it's important when anyone bleeds, you want to stop it. So we're doing something simple as getting blood from, from the vein. That's why we have to hold pressure to stop the bleeding. So if you mistakenly um, stick someone and you get bright, bright red blood, that means you nick the artery some way, some form, fashion, and you just need to hold pressure until that blood completely stops. And it, it, you have to hold pressure longer than it would take for you to draw blood from a vein. But yes, that answers your question. Artery, because arteries run deep. I don't know if this is a good um, angle or image for me to show you, but uh, you see our body has uh, arteries and veins here in this picture. You see the veins are typically blue in color. The arteries are typically red in color. And meaning the vein has no oxygen the artery has oxygen. So that's why that blood is always going to be a bright red blood versus our vein blood being a darker blood. Okay. But you see, uh-huh, go ahead. Can you go back to the other picture that you had with the definitions of them? Okay. I'll go back to it in just a second. So okay. as you can see, that everything starts from the heart. So you look at this picture of this lady, it starts from the heart and it's the main artery and then the main vein. So you see that we have arteries and veins throughout our whole body, okay? So that's why it's very important to know um, the, the kind of anatomy of uh, a person, of, of a human. So with that being said, um, arteries do lie deeper than veins, but as phlebotomists, we're only drawing blood from the veins, okay? We're not drawing anything from the arteries. If, if blood needs to be drawn from the artery, it's a doctor that does that, okay? Is that how everybody body set up? That is how everybody body is set up, yes, ma'am. All right. Yep, that's the anatomy of a person. So when you actually like maybe go further for nursing or whatever the case may be, that you will go through. And if if you if any of you have been already, you would go through prerequisites of taking anatomy and physiology, and it's 
always a part one and a part two. It's always a, a, a A&P one and A&P two because that particular subject is very detailed and it goes from the artery to the vein, to the muscle, to the skin. Like you're learning the whole anatomy of a person. This, you know, the posters that I have up in my class where it has all the different segments of a human anatomy and physiology is broken up to where you will learn all of that. So that is something that you will learn once you actually go further in your medical um in your medical career and it's very intensive. That's why, like I said, it's broken up into two. You take part one for the first four months and then you pay, take part two in the next semester. Um, and you learn about all the body systems. Um, but this is the, uh, the picture that you were talking about, right? With the definitions. Yes, ma'am. I just ain't um, fully get the definition for the IRI, like the last little sentence, but I got it now. Okay. Do I have any questions regarding arteries and veins? And again, in phlebotomy, you don't have to know, you know, in the, in the extensive, but I am getting your, you do have to know, we draw from the vein, you do have to know the vein carries uh, no oxygen versus the artery carrying oxygen, okay? And all it is, when you look back at that picture that I showed you, it's just, re our blood is just recycling itself in the body. OK, it's very I mean, for those of you, you may be very inquisitive of how the body work and a anatomy and physiology is that class for you to where um, the blood it, right now, our blood is recycling in our system. And that's what is circulation. It starts from the heart. So when I do that, when I do the CPR segment, I will get a little bit more in detail that I'm sure will blow y'all's mind because it blows everybody else's mind. but our blood is recycling in our system. It just recycles. The, the non-oxygenated vein blood is going to the heart. It gets the oxygen blood. And now it's coming out, out of the body as artery blood that is oxygenated. So that is our circulatory system. So if you ever known anyone that's, uh, that had to have an amputation in the arm or uh, in the leg for whatever reason, because that part of their limb, leg, arm wasn't getting oxygen, the circulation was off. So the doctor had to amputate that part, okay? In order for the rest of the limb to get oxygen, he had to, it, you know, that part had to be sacrificed. Okay, so our circulation in our body is very important and it starts with the heart with our blood. So the blood has to go to all of those areas to our body. So back to the, the other, uh, back to the other diagram that I showed um, with the, the whole person. You see, that's why it's very important for all of our body to get circulation. The arteries and the veins go through our body. So it's very important all the way down to the toes. You know, you ever heard somebody toes being amputated, somebody fingers being amputated. And that's why it has to be amputated because it's not getting any circulation. And for whatever reason, you know, the doctors did what they could. So now the only thing to do is to amputate that part because it's no use of having that particular part of a limb that is not getting no circulation. So now you're gonna cause the other portion of your body to uh, stop getting circulation, okay? So this is all why, this is called the circulatory system of our body and it starts with our heart. So as phlebotomists, we are drawing blood from the vein, okay? All right. I just give you straight what you need to know, but you're probably like, golly. But just imagine when you go further, you know, I've heard some of you say you want to go for LBN, you want to go for this. This is just getting your wet and your whistle. Okay. So with that being said, you will go in being knowledgeable in 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 a good bit of information. And you're just gonna add to it when you um, you know, continue your schooling. Okay, more in detail. Okay, because remember, as phlebotomists, you're just drawing your blood and then eventually going to start working in the lab and play with the blood, so to speak, to get the results. When you go for nursing and the other stuff, you, you have to know bigger entities. All right, 
So last but not least, I want to talk to you about anticoagulation and coagulation. We got our feet wet a little bit in the order of draw also on Sunday with the different color tubes and such. Um, I want you to know that when we meet again and also on, well, starting on Thursday, I will continue to talk about, Thursday will be a lot more of the order of draw because on Friday, your quiz is over the order of draw. Um, so I want you to know the definition of anticoagulation. If most of you know anti, the word anti just means stop, against, no, you know. So, and the word coagulation means to clot. So the word anticoagulation means stop the blood from clotting. I just want you to write that down because when we start going over the order of draw uh, again, well, more in detail. And remember, I told you guys that once we get our real blood, we're going to put it in the centrifuge machine and you'll be able to see the separation of the plasma and the blood. We're going to see that. OK, so I want you to know that anticoagulation means stop the blood from clotting versus coagulation means to clot. So I'm going to show you the tubes that the blood is meant to clot. And when you draw your blood and you do your inversion, obviously the blood is going from side to side in the tube. But once you let your blood tube sit for at least 20 minutes, you pick it up and you do your inversions again, the blood is not moving, okay? So I want you to see that in real life and you're going to see that. So that means that that tube, that blood tube is meant for the blood to clot versus some of the other tubes is not meant for the blood to clot. So I don't care if you draw the blood and you let it sit for 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, that blood still will not clot. And it has everything to do with the additives that's in those tubes that I told you ladies to start studying. Okay. Okay. So with that being said, anticoagulation means to stop blood, st uh, stop, uh, stops the blood from clotting, meaning it's not going to clot. It's going to still be, you know, liquidy, okay? Versus coagulation means the blood, uh, coagulation means the blood will clot. Coagulation, clot. Lean and me tomorrow. <laughs> huh? I said meaning me tomorrow. <laughs> meaning me tomorrow? Yeah. Wait, explain. Huh? Explain what you mean. The anticoagulation. That's, that's uh, remember I told you that's what they called it. Oh, meeting me tomorrow? Yeah. Oh, I can't even figure because you know by you having that PTT done, yeah. So that blue yeah, the, tube, the INR, yeah, I gotta go tomorrow. So the anti anticoagulation. That is an anticoagulation too, honey. Yep. And and when I start explaining the uh, more into the auto draw, I'm explaining to y'all that. And so typically, I mean, I don't want to jump the gun because I already went over a lot today with the medical terminology. But for sure, Ms. McCray, when you get your PTINR drawn in that light blue tube that it has sodium citrate as the additive that you invert through the five times, I want y'all to know that. The most common test, if anything y'all don't know yet, just know by Miss McCray getting her uh, blood drawn, she she keeps saying PTINR. That is the most common test in that light blue top two that you're going to see on your national exam. PTINR goes in a light blue top two, and the additive is citrate. It is an anticoagulation tube. So we're going to talk about it further. But when they draw her blood in that blue top tube, that blood that when it goes in her in that tube, the additive citrate is made for the blood not to clot. It's not going to ever clot. So, so now when they do it um, the same way we did the finger sticks uh, Sunday. So um, if I don't go to the lab to have it drawn, they do the finger sticks. And she put it in a machine like the glucose machine, but it reads my INR. Cool. That is a point of care testing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. But that that's good to know. So with that being said, uh, you know, just to get wet the whistle a little bit with anticoagulation and coagulation, 
please write down, take a picture. Anticoagulation means to stop clotting and coagulation mean um, is to clot. It's meant to clot. Um, and so with that being said, and maybe uh, Miss Lexi, I'm gonna send you, um, I need to send you this in the email. So, because we're, we still, oh, that's right, tomorrow. Oh, we're gonna talk after, uh, after here anyway, I'm gonna call you. Um, but with that being said, this paper here that I gave you all, I want you to, you know, if you haven't already, remember to start looking at it because um, this is what I want you to be accustomed to. Your, your tubes, the additives that's in there, how many times the inverted. And right now, the most common test, you can look at it, but I'm going to verbally tell you the most common test. So mentally, you don't study all these and get yourself confused. Now, look at that light blue top tube, the famous light blue top tube. Do y'all see that most common test that we was talking about? Yeah, I see it. PT, INR, PTT. These will be the two, the, the three tests that I tell you to remember what goes in the light blue top two. And you will see that. I can't, I can't stress to you enough. But in, in these tubes, I'm gonna tell you the most the three most common tests to look for. And they are common for a reason because even the test uh tests you on the most common test because the doctors, that's what they are. Okay, and then right here at the bottom of your page basically gives you the order of draw. And remember, the sterile one means our blood cultures because that's first in the order of draw. But on Thursday, this will be the segment of our uh, uh, lecture is talking more about the order of draw. And then I'm gonna get into special collections on Thursday as well, meaning there is some blood tests that you need to know as a phlebotomist, a phlebotomist that's collected in a special way. Meaning blood cultures are actually collected in a special way because remember you looked at it, they, they are bottles versus little uh, vacuum tainer tubes that uh, you saw. Okay, so I do want to go over that, but just continue to review your order of draw. Now on your paper, if I must add, this royal blue um, is the only one that I want you just not to concentrate on. Concentrate on your tubes that's in the order of draw, okay, which is going to be your marble or your goal, because those are the same as that tiger top that we did on Sunday. And then this is the plain red. And then these are the greens. They are the same. It's just one is light green, one is dark green. The gray top tube, remember we talked about that, and your purple tube. And then your pink tube, which is the same as the purple tube, okay? Um, and then um, your light blue top tube. Okay. So just start glancing over that because that's a bigger, that's besides knowing how to properly do your venipuncture procedure, the order of draw is next important, especially if you're going to work in a full, a full operated lab. Like if you're not going to a plasma center or a blood bank and you're going to work in a full lab or be a hospital phlebotomist, you have to know the order of draw. Okay. And we'll go over it again. I'll quiz you on it again. I'll do more games on it again, but I do need you to take your own time to get yourself uh, familiarized. Okay. It's 8.20. I know that we uh, went over a lot. Uh, 